Amen. Let's turn our Bibles into Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. We're going to be reading the first eight verses. Genesis 18, verses 1 through 8. The title of our sermon this afternoon is When You Have God Over for Dinner. Or maybe a better title would be Worshipping Through Hospitality. And the Lord appeared to him by the oak of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, don't pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man and prepared it quickly. Then he took the curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Amen. Let's bow our head and pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for giving us the joy and the privilege to be able to come into your presence. We thank you because we know that here in this place is our rest. We praise you because we know that right here we stand on the ground of grace. We thank you because you lead us into green pastures and into still waters and that your goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our lives. And so as we look into the life of Abraham and this moment in history when he saw God himself incarnate, may you come and teach us some lessons from his life that we can take with us and live by them, Lord, while we wait for your second coming. We ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. One of the most beautiful and precious biblical truths that we all cherish is the knowledge that God, as my brother prayed, can be and delights in fellowship and friendship with his people. In the book of Proverbs, speaking at the moment of creation, the wisdom says, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. This was in the moment of creation when man was created innocent and God delighted to, to have fellowship with him. But even after the fall, God still delights in fellowship and friendship with his saints. So for example, in Psalm 16, 3, it says, as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. In John 15, 15, our Lord reaffirmed this when he said to the disciples, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. In the Old Testament, Enoch was taken into heaven, and it says that because he walked with God, God loved his fellowship so much, apparently, that he took him up alive. But probably, as we all know, no one has experienced, or at least biblically, experienced the fellowship and friendship with God like Abraham. Abraham is known as the friend of God. 
And the nice thing about that is that it wasn't men who knew Abraham or knew about Abraham that called him the friend of God. It was God himself who called him. In Isaiah 41, 8, it says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. The reason I love you so much is because you are the children of my friend, Abraham. Uh, eight times this morning I counted it just to make sure. When we read the life of Abraham in the book of Genesis, eight times at least, God appears to him or speaks to him directly. From the day he left Ur of the Chaldeans, he appeared to him once, and then throughout his living in the land of Canaan. But of all those appearances, nothing is more remarkable and more um, vivid, if you may, as this appearance when God appeared to him in the form of three men at the door of his tent. And that's what we're going to call uh, the chapter that we're in, chapter 18, is broken into three sections. The first section, verses 1 through 8, is God appearing and having dinner with Abraham. Uh, verses 9 through 15 is a conversation about Sarah and reaffirming the promise that they will, in a year, indeed have a son. And then verses 15 to the end is, is God and Abraham talking and Abraham interceding when he realizes that God is going to bring judgment on Sodom and the cities that are surrounding it. So today we're going to focus our attention only on the first eight verses. And um, we're going to look first on, the, on verse 1, the place and the condition in which God appeared to him. And then we're going to look at verses 2 through 5, where we're going to look at the theophany, which is God appearing, appearing in the form of a man to Abraham, and how Abraham reacted to that theophany. And then we're going to look a little bit about at verses 5 through 8, the feast and the hospitality that Abraham offered uh, to, to God. So let's look at them together. Let's take verse 1 first. Uh, verse 1, it says, And the Lord, this is the condition and the place where God appears to him. And the Lord appeared to him by the oak of Memre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. The first thing is the oak of memory. Uh, this is the second time that God is documented for us, that God appeared to him by an oak. Uh, if you want to turn with me in chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, the first time when Abraham moved into the land, uh, in 12, 6 and 7, it says the following. It says, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So here we see a different, a, it's a different place, and, but it's still oaks, the oak of Morah. And it says God appeared to him by the oak of Morah. And Abraham built an altar. And now in chapter 13, in, in this chapter, we, he is in Hebron and with, where he ultimately settled and lived the rest of his life. And in, in, uh, in here, again it says in verse 1 in our chapter, God appeared to him by the oaks of memory. Now memory is a person who was an acquaintance of Abraham. We heard about him in, verse 14, in chapter 14 when Abraham went to liberate Lot. Uh, one of the people we hear about that went actually fighting with Abraham was memory. In uh, verse 24, chapter 14, says, uh, Abraham answers the king of Sodom, and he says to him, I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me, uh, let Anor, Eshkal, and memory take their share. So there's a memory. So this was a, an actual person. Apparently, he owned these oaks, and uh, the area was his, and that's why they're called the oaks of memory. And, uh, and Abraham was living in that Area. Now, oaks, uh, those oaks in that land, uh, commentators think that they were used as a place to offer their uh, pagan rituals. So it was a place of uh, pagan uh, worship. And what's remarkable, if that is true, is that in both places, 
Mora, and Memory. Abraham, right next to those oaks, builds an altar. And God appears to him right there. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham, and he built an altar in, in chapter 12, it says. And then in chapter 18, when he moved to Hebron, it says, So Abraham moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of memory, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord in chapter 13. Abraham was living in this world of Canaan, but he wasn't a part of the world of Canaan. He dealt with respect with the people of Canaan, and he earned res their respect. That's evident when you read his life. But what he didn't do was join in their fellowship of worship and become one of them. There is a, a remarkable uh, passage in chapter 24 when Isaac is grown and he's ready to get married. You know the story. Abraham calls his servants and makes him take an oath and he tells him the following in chapter 24. He says, you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. His servant says, well, what if she does, he tells him, you're going to go to my homeland and bring a, a daughter. He says, what if she doesn't want to come? He says, you're not going to take my son back there either. So you notice, I'm going to stay in Canaan. My son is going to stay in Canaan because that's the command and will of God for us to be in this land. But we're not going to, we're not going to join in their worship and we're not going to intermarry with them. No worship fellowship and no familial fellowship with these people. He's in the land, in this world of Canaan, but he is not of this world. And that's the first lesson we're going to take from him. We also as believers, God, we know, appears and speaks to those who separate themselves from the world. That's the lesson. We are a holy nation. We are a separate nation. And if we want God to speak to us and communicate with us, we have to be in a holy state before God. Christ said they are in the world, but they are not of the world. So that's the first lesson that uh, we want to uh, take from Abraham, sitting by the oaks of Mamre. The second thing you see in this verse is that he is sitting at the door. He's sitting in a position, sitting, resting at the door of the tent. Now, I want to draw your attention into the fact that at this point, he's recovering probably still from the circumcision procedure that he had. This appearance of the Lord happens after ch chapter 17 when he commanded him to circumcise himself and all the men in his household. And it says at the end of 17 that he did indeed go and circumcise all the men, including himself. And then in chapter 18, it says the Lord appeared to him. And Isaac has not been born. So this is a matter of few weeks or few months. This appearance is taking place from the time that he circumcised himself. So Abraham is sitting in a position and in a posture of obedience to God. He is in a state of obedience to God when God appears to him here. He has all, man is, uh, Abraham is a man of obedience. He has always obeyed. He's not a perfect man, but he's definitely an obedient man. He obeyed when he was called to leave his land and go into a land he didn't know. And when he, God commanded him to circumcise himself, he obeyed that command also. And that is the second lesson we need to take from Abraham in this, in this story. God will appear and speak to those who are willing to obey his commandments. Our disobedience brings a wall between us and our God. But God will appear 
and will speak to those who are willing to obey him. Remember, it was Peter's obedience in Luke chapter 14 when God told him after a long night of, of fishing, the Lord Jesus said to him, go back into the water and throw your net. And, and, and Peter obeyed the command and threw his net. And it was because he showed that obedience, the Lord Jesus said to him, you're going to follow me from now on, and I'm going to make you a catcher of men. If anyone loves me, the Lord said to them afterwards, will keep my word, and my father will love him. And, and listen to this amazing thing. We, me and my father, will come to him and make our home with him. Who do the, the father and the son come and make a home with? He who keeps my word. So Abraham is sitting in a position, he is an obedient man, and because he is so obedient, God is rewarding him by fellowship and friendship. The second thing. Third thing, he's living at the door of the tent, the tent. One of my favorite biblical pictures in the whole Bible has always been this picture of Abraham sitting at the tent. There's something about it that is so powerful. Here's this man who could have built not a house, he could have built a castle. He probably could have built a whole city if he wanted to. And yet he's sitting contently in a tent, living his life in a tent does not want to settle roots in this land at all. Now compare him, let's compare him to Lot, his nephew. Open with me, if you will, into Genesis 19, 1 and 2. And look at where Lot is living and how Lot is living. Genesis 19, 1 and 2. It says that the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when he saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself to his faith and said, My Lord, please turn aside to your servant's house. So you see where, where Lot is living? Lot is living in the gate of a city, by the, sitting by the gates of the city and living in a house. He's not living in a tent. But Abraham, who probably was ten times richer than Lot, is living in a tent. You can't blame Lot too much. It's human nature to want to settle down, to find a place you can call home, right? I remember growing up in Syria, we had a lot of Bedouins like Abraham. And I remember when I was very young, it didn't take long going, kind of taking a small drive out of the city, you would see Bedouins in their tents everywhere. What I remember caught my attention as I was growing older is when we would drive out, those things, little by little, started turning into actual homes. The tents would disappear, and because that's how you, we all want to settle down. We all want to have a home. We all want to set roots, right, in a place that we can call home. But uh, not Abraham. Abraham is very happy living in a tent. He is very content. Now, we have to ask questions then. Because the New Testament does make a, a point about him living a tent, in a tent. Why, why is Abraham living in a tent? It's, he doesn't care to build a house. And we have the answer, if you want to turn with me, in Hebrews chapter 9 and 11, uh, 9 to 10. Uh, Hebrews 11, 9 to 10. The author of Hebrews tells us, and he makes the point about living in the tent. Listen to what, what, he, what he says in uh, Hebrews 11, 9. By faith... He, Abraham, went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents. See, he's making a point of it for us. Living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was, here, here's the reason, because you, you know immediately, why is he living in tents? And the author gives us immediately the answer. For he was looking forward to the city 
that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This become even more dramatic when you think about it that here is that city of Sodom sitting right there away from his tent, not too far, which will soon be turned upside down. But why was Abraham living in a tent? Why is he happy with the tent? Because he had a heavenly perspective. Abraham wasn't fooled by the cities of this world. He was looking for the heavenly city whose designer and builder is God. He was looking for a city that had foundations. So we have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, are we people who are looking forward to heaven? Do we cry every day with the spirit and the bride saying, come, O Lord Jesus? You know, as I, I was thinking about this and the land and how he's not settling roots in the land. And I was like, you know, we fight over the land of Israel so much. Again, I had to keep referring to my childhood, but it is something I grew up with. But I grew up in Syria, and those of you who know politics in Syria, Syria is an arch enemy of Israel. So my entire childhood, I was brought up to be a fighter who was going to one day go and liberate the land of Israel from the occupying Jews. I came here thinking I'm finally rid of that foolishness. And to my shock is that the evangelical church is so obsessed with the land of Israel, so obsessed with it. Millions go to support the, the land and the country of, of, of Israel. And I was heartbroken. We care more about the land of Israel than Abraham ever cared about the land of Israel. Abraham did not settle roots in the land of Israel. He lived in a tent his entire life. And yet we spent so much effort and energy fighting over it. He was waiting for a better and everlasting city. 1 Timothy 6, 7, and 8 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and you cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. May God help us to live contently and not desire. It's not an easy thing, especially living in a prosperous country like we live in. To be, to be living a content life. Um, but may we have it in our hearts to be like him. So that's, that's the third thing that we take from this verse is that he lived, by, he lived a content life in a tent. The last thing about this verse is that he, God appeared to him in the heat of the day. Now the heat of the day is a time of calmness and relaxation. Uh, it is the middle of the day when that heat in that land is so hot that it forces everybody into their homes. Nobody can go outside. It's too hot. And so Abraham is sitting in the tent. Uh, usually people um, go have lunch in the middle of the day and then, and then just take a nap. And, that, and that's probably what Abraham was doing here. Uh, everybody is just relaxing and he's taking uh, a relaxed moment. Um, but I'll tell you, and we know this, God more often than not will speak to us in moments like that, in moments of quietness and moments of relaxation. He spoke to Moses when he was alone with his sheep out in the desert. He spoke to Elijah when he was alone, afraid and hiding in a cave. And he spoke and had a soft conversation with Peter in the early mornings of hours over a little bit of fire and breakfast. 
One of the beauties about the Sabbath in the Old Testament and the Lord's Day in the New Testament is exactly this, is that they gave the old people in the Old Testament and us as believers a day where we can just put a stop to the busyness of our lives and just take a day where we can just turn our attention to the Lord and give him a chance to speak uh, to us. So be zealous, brother, sister. Be zealous to reserve time of your day every day where you can be alone with the Lord. Don't waste that opportunity. It is then that God is going to speak. He's not going to speak to you when you're so busy, distracted by many things. He will speak to you in a moment of, of relaxation and calmness. Amen? So that's the first point. Next, we're going to look at the theophany, verses 2 through 5. A theophany means, like I said, uh, an appearance of God in a form of a man. So it says in verses two, uh, verse 2, He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the door, uh, tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little, wa a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. So what happens? He's sitting by the tent. He seems to be either dozing off, sleeping, or maybe he's praying because it says he lifted up his eyes. And as he uh, opens up his eyes, three men just appear. Notice it doesn't say they walked to him or they came. It says three men were standing right in front of him. Sudden appearance of three men. And so Abraham runs to them. And he seems to direct his conversation towards one of them. Because he says, O Lord. The word here, O Lord, is Adonai. is different than the, uh, the uses of the word Lord in the other parts of the passage. For example, the, the chapter started, and the Lord appeared. That's Yahweh appeared. Or when, God, uh, when he says to Sarah, is anything too difficult for the Lord? That's the word Yahweh. Uh, but here, it's not Yahweh, it's Adonai. Now, Adonai can be used as, a, as God, or it can also be used as we would use it in society, as a word of respect saying, sir. So which one did Abraham, uh, did Abraham realize who this is yet? I'm not sure. But he addresses him as Adonai, and uh, he seems to recognize that this one person of the three is very prominent. Of course, it's true, and he's right, because as we read the story as a whole, we realize that one of them is actually Yahweh, God, and the other two are just angels. We know they are angels, because if you look at chapter 19, uh, you see them appearing, you know, they're the two who left Abraham and, and the Lord and went to visit Sodom, and so he calls them angels. Um, we also know that this is actually the Lord because when they, the two left, it says that Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Or when he said to Sarah, is anything too difficult for the Lord, speaking of, of himself. So this is Yahweh, God in the form of a man and two angels. Now whether uh, this is a, um, an appearance of Christ, some commentators, it's, a, it's debatable, it's not clear as far as I can tell in the text that whether, who, whether this is the second uh, person of the Godhead or not. Some people seem to think so, some don't, it doesn't matter. What we do know is that this is uh, Yahweh appearing to Abraham. So there's three things I wanna, uh, uh, you know, how Abraham, notice I wanna bring to your attention three things in Abraham's reaction to this Theophany. The first thing I want to point to you is Abraham realized the privilege of this visit. Notice it says, um, he bowed himself to the earth. So regardless whether he's realizing that this is God or not, there is, um, he is addressing this person with uttermost reverence. The word bowed himself to the, to the ground or to the earth, 
is shaka in Hebrew, and it is used in in a couple of ways. It can be used as worship, as he worshipped. Uh, most uses, over 50%, uh, I think, is is translated as worship, but it can also be used as just paying homage or uh, giving a posture of respect to the person that is in front of you. Again, which one is it uh, that Abraham is, I, I don't think we can tell here in this moment, but he seems definitely to be paying a lot of respect. He bows himself to the earth. And then notice how he addresses him in verse 3. He says, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. He addresses him as Lord, and he addresses himself as his servant. So Abraham clearly is realizing that this is a privileged visit. This person is not just any person. I am in the presence of somebody great who is paying me, a, giving me a privilege and an honor to be visiting me in this hour. So I ask you, brothers and sisters, when we, hear, when we hear the Bible tell us verses like this, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Or when the book of Hebrews in chapter 4 tells us, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Or when James tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Do we realize what a privilege that is? Do we realize what the Bible is telling us? We, people who are born in sin, are given a privilege to approach or for Christ to come and be in our midst and visit with us. Do we realize the privilege that is to us? I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it is, this is not a cheap privilege that we have been given to be here this morning. If we truly believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is right here in our midst right now. For that to happen, Christ had to die on the cross to make that happen. In the book of Hebrews, the author says as much. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. He says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. See, you enter, you en how do we enter into the holy places? We can't enter the holy places. The only way we could enter the holy places is because of the blood of Jesus. Then he goes on, he says, by the new living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. It is the blood and the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ that had to take place on that cross for us to have this privilege to be in the presence of God. May God give us a sense of reverence and trembling when we enter into his presence. May we bow to the earth like Abraham bowed and say, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, you have come to see your servant. Because that's what's happening. So the, that's the first thing. Abraham realizes the privilege that he is going through. The second thing about this theophany is that Abraham shows eagerness to fellowship with God. Notice what he says in verse 2 again. When he saw them, what did he do? Ran from the tent. And then in verse 3 he says, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not 
pass by your servant. There is a sense of desperation in these words, right? It almost reminds you of Mary Magdalene when she saw the Lord in the resurrection morning, clinging on to the Lord, not wanting him to leave her again. That's the sense you get, do not pass by your servant. He is so eager to not let this opportunity pass. He is so eager to sit and converse with God. He's so eager to hear with this great person, whether again he realizes who he is or not, what has he come to say to me? May this be our prayer too. We've come into this house. God is in our midst. Let's say to the Lord, Lord, do not pass by your servant. Whether personally or as a congregation, God, right here, right now, this afternoon, has something to say to us. You're not here by coincidence. We're not here by coincidence. And God, let us be eager, not just to congregate because we love each other. May we be eager because we anticipate that God is going to speak to me this morning. Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? The words of eternal life is by you. We have come to take and to hear the words of the living God. Number three, why does he want him to come into the tent? Look at verses four and five. He says, he wants, in these verses, it seems to me that Abraham, because he realizes the privilege and the greatness of this man, he wants to return the honor by giving honor. Look what he says. He says, let a little water be brought and wash your feet. Rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread so that you may refresh yourselves. And after that you may pass, since you have come to your servant. He wants to wash their feet. He wants to provide refreshment. And he wants to provide rest for them. Under the he wants to honor them. He wants to give him the honor that is due to him. You see, it's one thing to be in the presence of God. It's another to give him honor. If you would open with me, it's just so we realize that there is a difference between being in the presence of God and there is a way where you can give him honor. Look at what happened in this story in Luke 7, 44 to 46. This is a story when the Lord Jesus enters the house of Simon the Pharisee, and the woman comes and does something to him, a sinning woman, a woman of the city, it says. She came and started crying and kissing his feet and just uh, washing them with her uh, tears. L look at this. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Now here is two people sitting in the presence of the Lord. But the Lord perceives one as dishonoring him and the other one honoring him. She's giving him his due. And that's what Abraham is doing. He's giving God the honor that is due to him. In, in, in John chapter 4, 23, remember the conversation with the Samaritan woman, the Lord says to her, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will, wor will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking 
such people to worship him. Notice he's not seeking people. He's seeking such people to What are they doing? They're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. They're honoring him in their worship by worshiping him in spirit and in truth, in other words. There's a condition that honors God, and there's a condition to the worshiper as he is in the presence of God to give honor to God. You have to honor him in a certain way. And one of these ways is to worship in spirit and in truth. But God, rest assured, is seeking worshipers who would give him the honor that is due to him. May God help us also when we come into his presence to seek to give him honor and worship. We don't want to just come so that our needs would be satisfied and fulfilled and our prayers would be answered. That is okay. But first and foremost, we want to come to offer God our worship and praise and honor. Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. And because Abraham realized this privilege and was so eager to, to have them and so eager to honor the Lord, what happens in response at the end of verse 5? God accepts his invitation. He says to him, go do as you said. We will come into your house. So that's the theophany. I'm moving a little fast because I'm going a lot longer than I thought I would go today. Uh, Abraham's hospitality. Let's move on to verses 6 to 8. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make it cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took the curds and milk and the calf and he, that he prepared and set it before them and stood by them under the tree while they ate. Two comments about the hospitality of Abraham. Number one, Abraham is being hospitable for the sake of hospitality. What Abraham is doing here is, is, is commonplace in those days. So, um, you know, when you look at, uh, if you look at uh, Genesis 19, which we will look at sometime along the, uh, down the road, we see when Lot saw the two angels, he did the same thing. He bowed, he invited them into his house. He was doing what was expected of people at that time. The book of Hebrews again makes a comment about this and says, do not neglect hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels and awares. And commentators think that this verse refers to Abraham hosting the three men and Lot hosting the two. And so he was doing what was customer. He's being hospitable for the sake of hospitality. This is what is expected when people come uh, to you. Now notice, Abraham had some legitimate reasons not to host them, I would think. Number one, they appear out of nowhere, unannounced. How dare they, right? <laughs> uh, knocking on the door, out of nowhere. We would just, I'm sorry, we're. Number two, they appear in the heat of the day. Again, inappropriate time. Don't you know that people are resting at this time? You're coming to, you know, at, in, in the middle of the day. Can't you come in the evening or in the morning? And number three, Abraham could have said to him, he's old, he's 99, Sarah is 90, we're old, we're too old to host anybody anymore. We've done our job. Let the young people host people anymore. But he doesn't do that. What does he do instead? He is more than happy to host. He runs to them. Please come into my house. Brothers and sisters, the Bible makes much about hospitality. More than we realize, 
the Bible teaches us so much about hospitality. I wish, I thought I would have much more time to go into this, but you know, and, and has, hospitality to strangers, that's exactly what the verse in Hebrews says. Do not neglect hospitality to strangers. He, didn't, he probably didn't know this is God. He's just hosting three people. Now, look, I said the Bible. Let me show you this passage. It's, it's an interesting passage to look at about hospitality. Let's look together at Judges 19, 15 to 20. This is one of the darkest stories in the Bible. This is a Levite and his wife in the days of Judges, which were days of darkness in the life of Israel and the history of Israel. This man is traveling from Bethlehem, is trying to get to his home. It gets dark on them, and they find, you know, they first pass by a city of um, uh, Jebusites, I believe it was, and, and his servant says, why don't you go into the city? He says, no, 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 They're, these are, you know, not Jews, uh, not Israelites. I want to go to a city of Israelites, expecting, because the Israelites, you know, are supposed to host people who come into the city. So they go into a city called Gibeah, which was in the tribe of Benjamin. Let's read the story. Judges 19, 15 to 20. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into the house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening, the man was from the hill of country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamin, Benjaminites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the travelers in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? And why, uh, where do you come from? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem uh, in Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come, I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I, uh, I am going to the house of the, um, of the Lord, but no one has taken me into his house. You see how he's surprised that nobody has taken him, taken him into the house? I expected to come here because it's a city of Israel, and expected to be, somebody would take me in, and nobody has taken me in. Verse 19, we have straw and, uh, uh, and feed uh, for our donkeys, with bread and wine for me and, my, and the female servant and the young man uh, with your servant. There's no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all you want. Only do not spend the night in the square. Now, uh, the reason I picked this story to, to, to speak about hospitality is because of this. The Gibeonites were wicked people. Wicked, wicked. When you read the, the rest of the chapter, they would end up raping this man's wife and killing him. They were wicked. But I would argue, we didn't need to see them raping this woman and killing her to know that they were wicked. Their wickedness starts to show its face in their lack of generosity and hospitality to this family. Wouldn't you say? That's how important hospitality is. It reflects our hearts. I'm not saying if you're not hospitable, you're wicked. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just making an extreme point to make an, that hospitality is so important. In Isaiah, the Lord speaks about hospitality as follows. If you want to open that passage in 58.7. He speaks about fasting. Again, he says to them, do you, know, do you know what kind of fasting I'm asking of you? This is God speaking to the Israelites. And he says the following in verse 7, Isaiah 58, 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? You want to fast? This is the fast I want you. Go bring the poor and the homeless into your house your house. That's true fast. Job, when he was pleading with God, his case, he says the following in, in 31, he says, the sojourner has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the travelers. Why is Job 
pleading his case, making a point of hospitality. Because he knows how important hospitality is to God. You care about hospitality, I have done so. I have opened my door to strangers. That's hospitality. So Abraham was hospitable for the sake of being just generous and welcoming. But I want to point to you also the nature of his hospitality. Notice, notice first the quality of his hospitality. Fine flour, verse 6. And verse 7, took a calf tender and good. One commentator said that in the Old Testament, when the worshiper would come into the tabernacle, you would bring to God, one of the offerings would be fine flour. And the other would be a lamb without blemish. In other words, you would bring to God your best of the best. Now, Abraham wasn't in, in Moses' times yet, but he is offering God his best. Fine flour. Fine here means, you know, uh, ground, ground, ground very finely, uh, but it was considered the most precious kind of flour. So he offers him fine flour and a good and tender calf. Again, the quality of our worship matters. Look with me into John 12, 1 to 6. This is the story of Judas and Mary, very familiar to us, right before the, the, the death of our Lord. John 12, 1 to 6, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume but Judas Iscariot one of the disciples who was about to betray him said why was this ointment not sold three hundred for 300 denarii and given to the poor you see here, here here's two people sitting in the presence of God right in the presence of Jesus one of them doesn't think Jesus is worthy of such high quality of service the other one thinks it's the least she could do because he is the most worthy person on the face of the earth. But the quality of the service matter. What we offer to God matters. The other thing I want to point to you is not just the quality, but the generosity. He says to her, to Sarah in verse 3, uh, uh, I believe, not three, I, I forget uh, the verse five or six maybe. He says to her, three says of fine flowers. Three says is 3.7 liters of flowers. I don't bake, maybe Brother Bill, if he was here, you could tell us, but from what I understand from the commentaries, this could have made so much bread that could have fed a city rather than just three men. And then when he takes the calf, he takes a whole calf to offer to three men. A whole calf could be enough for a wedding feast. But he offers it to them. So he's not only, he's not only being, uh, offering the, his best, he's also offering quality of his best. The Apostle Paul tells the Corinthians, he says to them, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Generosity. The third thing about his, his hospitality, his readiness to serve. What does he do after he prepared everything? He brings it and puts them under the table and offers it to them. It says that, he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Why is he standing? He's standing ready to serve. Just in case something is missing, just in case something they need, he is standing ready to serve. 
So brothers and sisters, we are commanded to be hospitable. There is many, many, many verses. I put them in the outline. I'm glad I did because I'm not going to have time to go through them. But we are definitely commanded. You may say, well, he, he was hosting God. You know, maybe he knew this was God and he was offering it. I would argue that based on what Jesus taught in Matthew 25 when he said, I was poor and I was sick and you did this to me, uh, right? And they'll say, when did we do all of that, Lord? And he said to them, when you did it to one of these little ones, my friends, you did it as if to me. When you host people, when you're generous towards people, it's as if you're doing it to the Lord also, isn't it? Hospitality is so important in the, in, in, in the New Testament that an elder cannot qualify to eldership if he's not hospitable. Hospitality is so important that in 1 Timothy 5, a widow would not qualify to receive help from the church if she had not opened her house to the saints and become was a good host to them. That's how important hospitality is. So in conclusion, we talked a lot about Abraham having a feast with God. But I want to show you one last thing before, as we wrap it up. If you would open with me one last verse in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Matthew 8, 11. This is our Lord speaking, and he says the following. He says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. 4,000 years ago, Abraham once hosted God. Where is Abraham now? He is in the kingdom of heaven, reclining at table, being hosted by God himself. After all the feasts of the Bible and all the feasts throughout human history are done with, Brothers and sisters, there's one last supper and feast that will take place. There is a feast prepared by God himself and will be hosted in the Father's house. There is something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation 19.9 it says, And the angel said to me, Write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. This invitation is not cheap by any means. Christ had to die on the cross so that you and I could feast in the house of Zion. If you're here today and you're not sure if you're going to be at that feast, I invite you today. All you have to do is repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will qualify to be invited and blessed at that supper. But for us believers, I just want to point you we are, invite, we are invited, we're guests at this supper, but we are also inviters. We're invited, we are blessed, because we know we're going to be there, right? But we're not just guests. While we're here on this earth, we also, on behalf of God, go out to the world, and invite others to come to that Last Supper, aren't we? Our Lord commanded us to go out to the world and make disciples. What is that? Isn't that inviting them to the, la to the marriage supper of the Lamb? That's exactly what that is. And I'll tell you, 
we invite them into our homes so that we could invite them to God's home. One of the most powerful ways to evangelize is when we open our homes for Bible studies, for meals, and invite others to come and join us. So we're invited and blessed, yes, let's rejoice in that. But also let's remember that we are inviters. And let us be, as Abraham was, generous, eager, offering our best, not making excuses, willing to serve those, willing to serve strangers and willing to serve saints alike. Amen.